So we're just going to dive into the story of the second Louise and our tale of two Louises, Vermilia in this case. And there's a lot more information in the newspapers about this one and more alleged murder. So buckle your seatbelts, kids. So, hey, we're, we're back in Chicago again. There was one article I read that detailed more than a handful of ladies who had allegedly caused some murder in, in the Windy City back in this time period. First, we start with the death of an Arthur Bissonette, who was a police officer in Chicago. The year is 1911. Bissonette was 26, died at Mercy Hospital on October 29th. Bissonette happened to be a boarder in Mrs. Louise Vermilia's house. There was also some speculation about a relationship between Bissonette and Mrs. V, but according to his will, he was not planning to marry Mrs. V. He'd been engaged to a Miss Lydia Riverd since January of 1911 and left practically everything to her. Police investigators looking into the deaths of Louise's relatives and acquaintances, were they all just a coincidence, as she says? Or more? Nine deaths! Holy crap! So it's about November 3rd now, and while no arrests have been made, no evidence of anything untowards just yet, the police are investigating and waiting on toxicology reports. As the investigation continues into these additional deaths, things are becoming more and more interesting. Frank Brinkamp, son of Mrs. V from her first marriage, was one of the deaths the police were looking into. Information was provided by Mrs. C. M. Bixier, uh, mother of Hazel West, divorced wife of Frank Brinkamp, again, the son of Mrs. V. Bixier said that her daughter Hazel told her that before she got divorced from Frank, they both feared that something would happen to them. If one of them were to die suddenly, the survivors should have the other's death investigated. When he died, though, they were divorced, so there was no investigation. More interesting investigation tidbits into Louise. E.M. Blocks, the undertaker when her first husband, Fred Brinkamp, died, said, quote, Mrs. Vermilia came to me and asked me to allow her to help in preparing the body. Of course, I could not refuse a widow. Such a request is that very well, although even though I thought it strange. She helped with her husband's body, and always after that, she was hanging about my place. Whenever she heard that there was a new dead body in my place, she would come down right away, and she would ask to help. After a time, the fascination seemed to grow upon her. She got so she would race off to a house in which a death had occurred the moment she heard about it. She would tell the relative she was employed by me and would take immediate charge of the body, handling it, and preparing it for burial. She reveled in the embalming of a body, and even I, who am a professional undertaker, do not like that work. End quote. He had never hired her, though she had told people she was employed there, and apparently her hanging about put a bit of a wrench in his marriage, until the then Mrs. Brinkamp married a Mr. Vermilia. Next death being investigated, Richard Smith, who, like Bissonette, was also a boarder in Mrs. V's house. She claimed that Richard was only a former boarder, but another former boarder asserted that the two, Richard and Louise, claimed previously to have been married and lived together as such. Saucy. Louise has been under house guard with two detectives for the week. This was reported around November 3rd. But upon the discovery of arsenic and bisonette, it's been said she will be arrested. She is asked to make a will, and there is concern that she may harm herself. So the police guard at her house has been doubled, and female nurses are now at her bedside. So let's visit the list of money that was left to her by the deceased. This is according to one newspaper, so I can't vouch for full accuracy. Fred Brinkamp, first husband. He left $5,000 to her. He was 66 years old and died on the farm at Barrington, Illinois after short illness. Once he died and her two children, Cora, eight years old, and Florence, four years old, died, she found herself flushed with cash and unburdened and headed to Chicago. The children's causes of death were unknown. Charles Vermilia, second husband who had been a widower with his son, Harry, died two years ago, leaving her $2,000. He was 59 years old and a Chicago and Northwestern Railroad collector. He died of alleged acute gastritis after a six-day illness in August 1, 1909. Frank Brinkamp, son of first marriage, leaving her $1,200. He was 23 years old and died supposedly of a pneumonia at the home of Louise's sister on October 30, 1910. Harry Vermilia, 
35 years old, stepson, supposedly died in 1904, but some say in 1910, apparently had a quarrel with his stepmother over the sale of a house and then died not long thereafter. Lillian Brinkamp, I've seen her referred to as the granddaughter of Fred Brinkamp and also as the stepdaughter of Mrs. V. But regardless, she was about 26 years old and died in 1906 at Louise's home of acute nephritis. Richard Smith died March 11, 1911, rooming at her house, allegedly left her $2,000 in life insurance and was thought by some to have been her third husband. Supposedly, they had started a bit of a hanky-panky while she was still married to Charles. Well, then Charles died, so... November 6th. So now it's confirmed that Mrs. V did swallow arsenic to allegedly try to end her life and was now laid up at home, ill. Judge Walker, his clerk, detectives, lawyer Burris, her lawyer, crowded into her room. She lay in bed as her visitors crowded about. The clerk called the case People versus Vermilia for Bissonette's murder. The warrant was served. It was determined that she be removed from home and sent to the county jail's hospital. The then fiance of Frank Brinkamp, Elizabeth Nolan, Frank Brinkamp was her son from first marriage. Elizabeth made a statement regarding Frank's deteriorating condition before he was removed from Mrs. Vermilia's home, and that his symptoms were identical to arsenic poisoning. So the coroner wanted Mrs. V examined by doctors to see if she may be suffering from necrophilism. I don't know if they quite mean that she was doing <clears throat> certain things to the dead bodies as we understand necrophilia to be now. It reads more like that she just had a very strong fascination with corpses. If she has that, she could not be legally held accountable for the murder. It would need to be committed to the asylum for the criminally insane. At this point in time, it was thought that necrophilism's victims were women from 40 to 50 and who usually were mothers. It involves a very deep delight with death and the property of deceased people and fascination with murder. Two different undertakers have stated of her fascination with their work. The aforementioned E.M. Blocks was one of them. Her alleged boy toy was another. He's coming up soon. Neighbors would say if there was a death in the neighborhood, Mrs. V was hot to trot to head over to the house. Apparently her house has pictures of the dead and cemeteries and of the cemeteries, just random pictures she liked, not really those of relations buried there. She happens to have a picture of Richard Smith and nearby a picture of his tombstone. Coroner Hoffman is definitely on the choo-choo train of necrophilism, a, as he calls it, woman's disease, but I don't see that this ever came up again later. Prosecution wants to get her indicted by a grand jury ASAP because her own lawyer is trying to get her out on bond in a sphere that she will attempt to commit suicide again. Coroner Hoffman is also very suspicious of the outcomes of several of the deaths involving her, that the symptoms prior to the death don't make sense for their cause of death. Frank Brinkamp's coffin was exhumed and poor Miss Nolan, his fiancee before his death, was asked to identify the body, which is so freaking sad. She was unable to look at his body, but was able to accurately describe some pieces of jewelry that had been buried with him. Now, as an aside, I just have to say, I enjoy the Daybook newspaper out of Chicago back in this time period. They provide interesting stories, lots of pictures, and kind of have a more fun vibe to them. Anywho, November 9th, heading, Ugly and Squat, Drew Men by Mental Power and Subtle Flattery. How has this woman able to entice men of all ages and conditions. Mrs. Vermilia is far from beautiful. She is short. Her figure is almost stumpy. She has high cheekbones that give a look of coarseness to her face. Her hair is short and limply heavy. Her eyes are furtive and seemingly without compelling power. Even her complexion is poor. What quality was it that drew men to the side of Louise Vermilia, drew them to love and then to death? Apparently, her letters to men were full of subtle flattery, written with much care and thought. Well, my work could have been her mind that they were interested in. So sad that this was thought to be so extraordinary, that men would find an unattractive woman appealing because she could write well and use her brain. The horrors! Oh, wait, um, yeah, she allegedly killed some people. Okay, back to the story. Anyway, another new name to maybe add to the investigation when Jason Ruppert, fireman, frequented her flat for some time. 
He died January 17, 1910, in the hospital. His complaint was acute gastritis. A friend of his asked for an inquiry into his death, as nothing was wrong until after they had dined at her house. Interestingly, Undertaker Boyson, a second Undertaker, her alleged boy toy, asked for Rupert's body a mere five minutes after he died. After Rupert died, his insurance policy, trunk, and some clothing could not be found. So allegedly, Mrs. V admits her first husband, Fred Brinkamp, died of poisoning, but she said it was from a cider consumed from poison copper kettle. Nothing, anything she did. Says she doesn't understand Bissonette's poisoning and denies that she tried to end her own life and oddly made this statement while she was suffering in pain from the arsenic she had taken. Her interview is as follows, quote, It is an awful thing for a woman like myself, 45 years old, to be held in jail charged with the murder of one of my best friends. It is worse to be held up to the public as a sort of monster who probably has committed almost innumerable crimes. But I am not alarmed. I know what I have done and what I have not done. She was appalled by the accusation against her of killing her own dearly beloved son also. Quote, Let me say now that the only human being for whose death any insurance was paid to me was my son Frank. Is that extraordinary? He was my son and I his beloved mother. What more right than he should have to ensure his life in my favor. Quinn quote. She said her first husband was not insured when he died, nor her two little girls. Richard Smith did not profit her in the least. She said that the undertaker statement, this would be Ian Blocks, that she loved hanging out with the dead is ridiculous. Quote, I did not expect that my good offices in caring for the dead would be used by the police as evidence to prove me a murderess. I am the victim of a strange combination of circumstances. It is true that my nearest and dearest friends all have died distressing deaths. Some fatality seems to have pursued my family, but I cannot explain that. End quote. November 9th, 1911. Coroner Hoffman, you actually may remember him from the other Louisa story. He's been very busy. Now he wants to exhume the body of Charles Vermilia, Mrs. V's second husband. Undertaker C.C. Boyson, or C.C. Boytoy, as I call him, has been affianced to, to Louise allegedly and was named as a beneficiary of her insurance policy. He had apparently suffered from stomach disorders after eating in her house. Boyson believed that she had tried to poison him previously, but wouldn't state why he didn't report it. Apparently it's because they were never engaged and he just called on her now and then and would have dinner. November 10th. It's been reported that Mrs. V is suffering from heart disease and could die at any time per a jail physician. They are unable, though, to explain her frequent relapses after this much time has passed since her arsenic self-dose. She should be able to eat by now, but has allegedly been unable to and complains of stomach issues and nausea. It's been insinuated she may have somehow ingested more poison since that Saturday, but she has been watched closely every minute, so that seems impossible. Her visitors have been watched closely as well to ensure that nothing is being passed to her. She has lost weight from the effects of not being able to eat and is not very mobile. Coroner Hoffman declares he has more evidence than gets Mrs. V, but is keeping it close, not saying what it is, yet. There is also suspicion regarding Undertaker Boyson, who he says he wasn't an intimate friend of hers, and who Mrs. V says their relationship is only professional. But why is he named as a beneficiary of hers and her affianced husband in the insurance policy? Boyson's been quite involved with several of the dead bodies involved. He buried Richard Smith. He contacted the hospital to get Ruppert's body five minutes after Ruppert died, as already mentioned. He appeared at the hospital five minutes after Bissonette died. Hmm. But Boyston continues to refuse to discuss and denies any alleged relationships. Several have made official statements that Boyston was with her when she collected money on her son's life. Mrs. Maysack, also a boarder in the so-called House of Death, said in her affidavit that Smith and Mrs. B shared the same room, and when he died, Mrs. B told Masek that she expressed regret about not making their marriage public. Little black pepper box with arsenic? Hmm. Bissonette and his brother Peter, who had gotten sick after eating with his brother at Mrs. B's, Peter thinks he remembers seeing this pepper box. The father, Arthur Bissonette Sr., has no doubt in his mind. He remembers seeing the pepper box and using the pepper box and being sick right afterwards after eating at the Mrs. V flat. Lombroso, Italian criminologist, says, quote, What terrible criminals children would be if they had strong passion, muscular strength, and sufficient intelligence. 
And if, moreover, their evil tendencies were exasperated by a morbid psychical activity. And women are big children. Their evil tendencies are more numerous and more varied than men's, but generally remain latent. End quote. Not going to identify any of that. Anyway, let's make it official. Arsenic had been found in large quantities in Frank Brinkamp, her son from first marriage, and in Richard Smith, railroad conductor who boarded her in her home, and her professor, Dr. Walter Haynes, had caused their deaths. Both deaths were considered suspicious. Smith did not die of acute gastritis. Brinkamp did not die of typhoid fever. Quote, they were both murdered by poison and died in agony caused by the monster in human form who administered the poison to them. End quote. She was still in jail hospital and had not been told of the findings of arsenic. Apparently, she had shown some improvement and would probably be moved from the jail hospital. November 11th. Newspaper, The Daily Graphic, out of Pine Bluff, Arkansas, quote, Quite the most remarkable prisoner ever housed in the jail hospital, Mrs. Bermilia spends the greater part of her waiting time either studying the ceiling or her eyes nearly closed, but thinking all the time, end quote. She had denied that she had named Undertaker Boyston as her husband in her assurance policy. Well, now she's saying she never denied it. Ha! No backsees! November 13th. Now it's said that the pepper box she took on Saturday was not the right pepper box. The pepper box the nurse had handed her was the one she used to kill roaches with. The contents killed the roaches. She didn't smash them with the box. Well, that box was analyzed. It had pepper in it. And arsenic. Why would your roach box contain pepper in it also instead of just arsenic for your roach buds? Um, hmm. Police are eager to speak with the nurses who were with Frank. Undertaker Boyson, boy toy, would probably end up being the star witness. He finally admitted that, yes, he was listed on the insurance policy as her affianced husband. He apparently wrote <coughs> crazy woman in the ledger near this entry. Next to be exhumed, Lillian Brinkamp, her stepdaughter or Fred's granddaughter, who died January 21st, 1906. November 14th, Mrs. Hazel West Brinkamp Ray, divorced wife of Frank, remember her from earlier? She's disappeared. Expected to be a strong witness, she has not been home for two days and no one knows where she is. This had been her original statement. Quote, Frank was dying. Mrs. Vermilia handed her son a glass of water, but he pushed it aside. He said, no, there's something wrong with that. I am going the same way my stepfather did and that boyson will soon chuck me into a rough box and haul me away in his wagon. End quote. As if there wasn't enough excitement, apparently there was a fire in or near the jail and the alarm went off, which sent Mrs. B into shock and a relapse. Interestingly, there was another witness to Frank who had the opposite account of Frank than his ex-wife. She said she never heard anything said that could incriminate his mother. A Martha Anderson had told the police she wanted to make a statement about Richard Smith, but still has not done so. Then there is a lockbox of Frank's that the police would like to see the contents of, but Mrs. V said the key is with her lawyer. And now, for some reason, the paper is back to saying that Boyson denies anything to do with Mrs. V. So what the heck? You want more intrigue? We got it. Alice N. Anderson made a statement about Richard Smith, who kept a room at her house at the same time he had a room at Mrs. V's house. She said about a week before he died, he had told her that Mrs. V wanted him to become an undertaker, and she would pay for him to do it. She knew an undertaker, but didn't like him. Apparently, this undertaker had threatened Smith to leave Mrs. V alone or he'd kill him. Is this undertaker boy toy Boyson, maybe? Smith became very sick, and then she never saw him alive again. She also stated, quote, Smith also told me that Mrs. Vermilia had threatened to kill him unless he left his wife, end quote. Mrs. Anderson made the statement voluntarily. Mrs. V continues to be on a kind of suicide watch. So remember that Mrs. V was not wanting to eat? Apparently the jail matrons were cooking themselves a steak. Mrs. V sniffed it, as you do, and said she wanted some. The matrons were like, no, we bought this with our own money, not for prisoners. Mrs. V said she'd report them to the jailer. So is she still sick or what? November 17, 1911, Mrs. V refuses to attend the coroner's inquest and had her doctors tell the court that she was too weak to move. So now this inquest has been postponed to November 27th. December 21st, 
Newport Plain Talk newspaper said, quote, from obscurity to infamy in a day is the surprising record of Mrs. Louise Vermilia, the woman of death, as she has become known in local criminal annals. One day, an ordinary woman with nothing to differentiate her in public estimate from thousands of other women, she suddenly loomed up as one of the arch poisoners of modern times, end quote. January 6, 1912, Mrs. V is still in the county jail's hospital and has still shown no improvement. Nurses and doctors think she's faking it. March 7, 1912, Chicago's Lucretia Borgia. Finally, Louise goes on trial today. She was carried into court in what I assume was a type of wheelchair for the murder of Arthur Bissonette. But then she was freed briefly when apparently the assistant state attorney nulled or dismissed the charge regarding Bissonette. And then as she was being wheeled out, she was rearrested on a charge that charged her with the murder of Richard T. Smith, the railroad conductor and boarder in her house. Talk about drama! Prosecution states that they have the evidence to prove without a doubt that she poisoned her victims to get their life insurance. At this time, it's believed the defense will attempt to put in an insanity plea. She declares her innocence and that this was all an unfortunate chain of circumstances over which she had no control said this particular newspaper. March 10th, 1912. She says death is preferable to jail suffering. She's emaciated and worn with months of sickness, resulting from when she attempted to take her own life when she was arrested. Her attorney is secured an immediate hearing as Louise had already been, quote, suffering the tortures of death in the jail for five months, end quote. Judge Honore granted the immediate hearing. Prosecution abandoned the bisonette charge because they had learned that the policeman had been on some sort of medication prior to all of this that did contain some arsenic. Now she's charged with Smith using something called, quote, rough on rats, end quote. In jail, she declared that the hand of death had been laid upon all whom she loved, that death had always been near her since she was a child, and her constant companion in her home. Well, when you've got rough on rats lying around, sure. The state thinks her fascination with death and her desire to attend funerals prompted all of this. Though the judge had said the hearing would commence, the state said that it wasn't possible and there was an adjournment until the following Monday. April 2nd. Apparently some issues with Mrs. V's hypnotic eye. Could this have been part of her allure? April 4th. Mrs. V took the stand, said Mr. Smith had already been ill and she only gave him medicine that a doctor had already prescribed. April 6, 1912. Testimony of Russell F. Thompson testified that Richard Smith had threatened to commit suicide one night in January 1911. Defense is relying on this and the denial of the defendant. Defense rests. April 6. Jury deliberated for eight hours, nine to three for conviction, and that never wavered. So, hung jury. June 28, 1912. Louise was released from jail today, bonding out at $5,000. Lawyers apparently applied for her release because they thought the hot weather would cause her suffering if she remained in jail. Her condition is still poor and she's paralyzed from when she attempted to take her life with arsenic. July 4th, 1912, rumors rolling that Louise will not ever face trial after she was released on bond. So per Ancestry.com, she died December 31st, 1913 in Illinois. From what I can tell, between July 1912 and December 1913, nothing had ever happened to her as far as another trial or being accused of any of the other deaths and going to trial. So ends the second tale of a Chicago Louise, alleged murderess but never convicted. If she was innocent, then yes, she did suffer a lot of losses, but I'm sorry. There's coincidence and then there's murder. So we'll be back next week. It won't be true crime, but for the next time I do a true crime story, I can't promise we won't be back in the city of big shoulders because, whoa, Nelly, they got a lot going on. See you.